When I stepped out of my door to get the newspaper on the morning of September 12, 2001, the first thing that struck me was the way the air smelled. It smelled like burning metal. Drifting slowly above my home, which is located about 34 miles from lower Manhattan, was a huge grayish brown plume of smoke. There was no doubt about its source. I opened my newspaper and began reading through it. When I came to page seven, I stopped cold. There in front of me was one of the most stunning news photographs I had ever seen. The composition was perfect, parallel vertical lines in a man, a falling man, posed as if he were casually walking down the street on an otherwise beautiful day. The reality of the image was that he was upside down and falling to his death. The photograph was simultaneously peaceful and horrifying. In my mind, it's the most powerful news photograph I've seen to this very day. Yet despite the fact the image was printed in numerous newspapers on September 12th and is universally recognized for its strength and significance, it was later suppressed. Editors were called to apologize for publishing it, and for years the image was not seen. We're coming up on the 16th anniversary of 9-11. In front of us is the very newspaper I picked up from my front step all those years ago. Joining John Harris and myself today is the person who captured that page seven photograph, Richard Drew. And the photograph that has since become known as The Falling Man is the topic of today's show. Before we go any further, we'd like to acknowledge that this is an obviously a very important and sensitive topic. And we're holding this conversation with the utmost of respect, respect for the victims, the survivors and families, as well as first responders and journalists. We in this room are all New Yorkers, and we were present that horrible day. And while we will be discussing a photograph, perhaps in detail, some will not appreciate, realize that the sadness, tragedy, and yes, the terror of this subject is never out of mind. Welcome, Richard. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining us today. Thank you for having me today. Uh, let's just give a little uh, uh, um, background here. You are an Associated Press staff photographer and a recipient of a 1993 Pulitzer Prize for feature photography. Uh, as a veteran photojournalist, you've been photographing news events at Home and Abroad for going on 50 years now, right? Uh oh, well, that's for the AP. It's 48 to the AP. 48, but 48. who's counting? Yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> at age 21, an early assignment had you at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles the night Robert Kennedy was assassinated. You pretty much covered everything from the mundane to the historic, from presidential campaigns to natural disasters. On September 11th, 2001, you were covering a maternity fashion show in New York when your editor called with reports of an explosion at the World Trade Center. And I was talking with the CNN cameraman. We were waiting for the um, fashion show to start. And he was live that day. They were going to show it as the first day of Fashion Week. And he put his finger to his ear where his earphone was and so he could hear the control room. And he said, wait. Wait, there's been a there's been an airplane set at the World Trade Center, and just then my office called, and the editor said, "An airplane set at the World Trade Center. Bag the fashion show. You have to go." And I said, "Okay." And so I grabbed my equipment, and at that time, Fashion Week was in Bryant Park, which is uh, at Forty Second Street and Sixth Avenue here in New York. And I walked a block over to Times Square, and I took either a two or three express subway train down to Chamber Street, which is just north of the World Trade Center. And I came and walked up the stairs, and there I saw both towers were on fire. So you were there after the second plane hit? I didn't even know there was a second plane uh. until I made my way across. Uh, as that, that day, the wind was blowing from west to east, and I didn't want to be having the smoke coming toward me. And so I slowly made my way, avoiding police and fire people, over to West Street, which is uh, the where the West Side Highway used to be. And I was making pictures because then I don't want I could see the towers, and I was told by the police that I should go over where the ambulances are. I didn't know there was a second plane until I was standing between a police officer and a woman EMT, and the police officer said, "You know, I was here when that second plane hit." And I said, "Second plane?" He said, "Yeah, it was a big effing plane. It was a, a, like a 737, and it well, apparently was a 737." I'm assuming you're shooting all along. Was was your primary interest the, the fires in the buildings or the victims, or, or what was your, your well, thoughts? Uh, when I got there also, the fire, firefighters, had, they wear uh, what are called Scott packs. They're like their, their air packs they wear on their back, and they breathers. And I remember hearing that when they run out of air, they make a beeping sound, beep, beep, beep. And I remember that they were a lot of them were lined up along the median strip in – uh, on West Street, and they were going off beep, 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 and I was photographing the firemen 
who had already been in there trying to battle whatever fire there was and all the first responders. And I was photographing the first responders because there were no victims being brought toward the ambulances because there really weren't any really survivors. If you were a survivor, you got out and you walked out. How did you divide your, your, your concentration? Because as we're talking, I'm thinking about how do you divide your attention because there's so much happening over such a broad piece of territory in real estate and it's it's developing as it's going on. It's not like it happened and this is now just going to simmer down. Yeah. I, I could see both towers. And like I say, I was standing between the EMT and the New York City police officer. And he's the one who said, oh, my gosh, look up. And, and we looked up and we saw people coming down on the building. And so I was concentrating on that as well as trying to capture the scene. You have to... You don't, you don't have a lot of time in a breaking news situation to have to compose what you're going to do. You have to react to it. And that's part of the, the skill set of a news photographer, being able to how, adapt at that. How long after you'd been there did this moment happen where, you know, you're, you looked oh, like... I, I don't it, know. I, I, I don't have any concept of time from yeah, that. Yeah. I'm sure maybe Tom, Tom Janot's article in The Falling Man in Esquire, he, right. he might have catalog that. Well, they have the, you know, the exact moment of that photo has been mm. documented at 9.41.15 a.m. Because so, the camera yeah. had a, a time code. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, incredible. Well, okay, so you took those photos and you went from there to look at other aspects of what was going on and photograph well, other aspects. Here's the interesting yeah. part. Because uh, I was near my office at that time was at, in Rockefeller Center. Mm -hmm. And Brian Park is only six blocks away. I was going to go back to the office to transmit my fashion pictures. Mm -hmm. So I usually carry my laptop with me, but since it was so close, I was going to go right back to the office. But I didn't have my laptop, so I had to continue shooting and then somehow make my way all the way back from Lower Manhattan to Rockefeller Center mm -hmm. before I could ever transmit my photos. So you filled your card and well, decided yeah, to go back. Actually, basically. it's interesting. I actually took the card out of the camera from the fashion and put it in my pocket. And then I started with a fresh card and I was back uh, shooting with that. Do you have a sense of how many photos you shot that day? Mm, no, I have them all on a, a disc, but I, you know, I've never counted them. Who since. owns those pictures now? The AP does. They do? Yes, sir. Okay. And after this, this series that, you know, the, the Falling Man sequence, um, what did you photograph? What was, I mean, you were there for the building's collapse. Right. Well, he, yeah, at what point do you say I got to get back when something like that is happening? Well, I photographed the first building collapsing. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard the sound of it, uh, of what I thought was like a rock slide or, or you know, like a like an avalanche kind mm -hmm. of thing, and I instinctively turned my camera o t toward the South Tower, and I photographed what I thought was like the facade of the building coming down, mm -hmm. and it was actually the collapse of the first building. And some other EMT grabbed me and dragged me down the street and says, "We got to get the heck out of here." And he dragged me down the street and probably saved my life by doing that. Mm -hmm. And then I made my way back up to continue photographing whatever was going on. I made there were people walking out yeah. and with masks on their face, I mean, with their hands on their face and handkerchiefs and things. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then the police started moving everybody out, and they were pushing everybody north to go out. And and uh, I didn't want to leave the scene. So in there, there's a median strip uh, in the. Uh, North End Avenue, I believe it is, which I think is the most west street in Manhattan, mm -hmm. just south of Stuyvesant High School. And there and there was like uh, bushes, and I sort of hid in the bushes and let people walk by me, and the police walked by me and all that. Being foolish as I was, I'd seen one building collapse, right? So I wanted to, didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. So, and I got up and I started to photograph the, sec the second tower was on fire, and I put on a short lens. Uh, I don't remember what the short zoom was. And I started photographing that, and just then the top of the North Tower exploded like a big mushroom. It's just mm -hmm. mushroomed out, mm -hmm. and I have a whole sequence of the photos of the South Tower collapsing. Mm -hmm. And with North that, Tower. I... I'm sorry? The, the North Tower. I'm the sorry, the North Tower. Yeah. Sorry, the North Tower uh, collapsing. And after that, I decided it was time to uh, maybe get out of there. And was that a safety decision, or you figured... I, I figured I had was, my stuff, right. and, and I, had, uh, I had both towers collapsing... And uh, so I went into Stuyvesant High School. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the south entrance to Stuyvesant High School, and I went into the lobby, and the um, 
the building still had students in it. Mm. Pretty interesting. And I was looking at the back of my camera on the little screen at that time, a tiny screen, seeing what I had. And then I had to answer the call of nature. So I went into the uh, went in the men's room and I started splashing water in my face because I was all covered in that mm-hmm. dust. And all, and I was clearing my eyes, and then uh, I don't know, a police officer, some mem- some member of the service, came in, slammed the door, and says, "We got to get the heck out of here. There's a sure. gas leak in the basement." And I said, "Oh!" And I grabbed my glasses, put them on, and I went outside the north side of the building, and started walking up uh, the west side of the highway. And was there any moment in, in this time where you had kind of broken out of work mode and and were kind of assessing or or? fearing or needing to call home or is there any or is it just no it's zone? just just it, it's it's instinct yeah it, you yeah. just keep working and doing your job and and capturing history right and was it i'm sorry was was there did you think of the series the various photos that you had shot that there was something that you, that was particularly interesting i mean did you realize okay this is the stuff i know i need to get back and show i didn't have time to review all of my photos on mm-hmm. the back of my camera. I decided to keep doing my job. And when I get back to the office, I can then look at them on my computer and I can see what I've got and, and do the edit then. Mm-hmm. I didn't see the falling man photo until mm-hmm. I got back to the office. Right. Did I, you catch it on the first zip through the uh, images? Or did it, were you just going through and all of a sudden it caught you or did you this exactly, is the second take? Exactly. I was, I was sitting uh, uh, at a desk because... Uh, uh, an unoccupied desk at our office that because people were coming in with photos uh, they were done on film we were still back in film days it was 50-50 film because I was yeah. in photo care and I remember that day people were coming in buying memory cards and film yeah. so people were coming in I guess they found out where the AP was and they were showing up and we were processing their film and we were scanning their pictures uh, scanning the negatives then to put it into our digital photo operation and I, I opened up my laptop on an empty desk and I started going through my pictures and I called one of our photo editors over who regrettably just passed away yesterday. Uh, and he, uh, I said, Mike, look at this. And he said, okay, that's it. And we both saw the symmetry of the picture and, uh, but yet the quietness of it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a building collapse. It wasn't a fire. There was nobody maimed. It was just a very, Zero gore. Zero, nothing. It's not... If you look at the, uh, pictures that have been accepted, uh, or news pictures, uh, I can take you back to uh, Vietnam, uh, Nick Utz picture of the napalm girl running down the road. Eddie Adams with the... Eddie blue. Adams, exactly. Picture of the uh, shooting the Vietnamese in the head. The and you could just stare at those knowing with... All- it's so obvious what the horror is, what's going on there. Yeah, but your see, picture, get, people get blown away but by But those happened not on our soil. But yet John Philo's ah, yes. picture from Kent State uh, of the uh, after the the victim, what the student was shot by the uh, National, National Guard, Guard yeah. National Guardsman, uh, that picture has been accepted. And these are three violent pictures, and they all are show some agony and everything. And but yet my picture is a very quiet photo. There's no blood. There's no guts. There's no gore. And you don't, he's not hitting the ground, and yet it's caused a, quite a controversy, and people are shied away from it. I think because they can identify with that photo, because what would they do in those cer- in that circumstance? I mean, if you have smoke, you can't breathe. Uh, in some of the other pictures I have from that day, there's uh, uh, I have pictures of people falling, and yet on the outside of the building, there I have there's an image of a man holding on to the outside yeah. of the building. So it's. It, who knows if that man holding on the outside of the building, if he ever got back in or he was also one of the people who fell from the building. We still don't know if they refer to as jumpers. We don't know they were jumpers. Well, that's another thing. The, the documentary Falling Man, I watched it way back when when it came out. And we watched it again this week just to freshen up. And um, one of the things that kind of strikes me is that the coroner's office refuses to call them jumpers. They were forced out. They were blown out. But they will will not say that these people had to make a conscious decision Nobody of knows. how they were going to die. But and I'm going to jump back a little bit yeah. to when you were in the editing room. Uh, was it an immediate? There was a no brainer that this was the photo. Absolutely. Uh, it's just the picture. It mm-hmm. just 
was there. It had the symmetry. It's a stunning photograph. Yeah. You know, on, the, on that same topic now, we have the newspaper. I have the New York Times right here. This is the paper I picked up that morning from my doorstep. Now, the cover of it is is pretty darn dramatic. It's the it's the, the it's the South Tower after the second plane getting hit and the ball of fire, and you can see black smoke against the gorgeous blue sky. Your picture's on page seven. In black and white. In black and white. Ah, okay, that's right. It was color up front. That's I, right. That's right. I think it's in black and white. And it's also, I don't have a name credit on that picture either. Hmm. Well, we're going to straighten all that out. Oh, um, no, <laughs> no. Somebody somebody very close to me already straightened that out with the New York Times. It is in color. It is in color. It is oh, in I color. Back. Sorry. But it was pushed, again, page seven. Mm -hmm. and, and you recognize it as being a very dramatic photo. Did they, were they already feeling it in their gut that this might be too much and that's why they buried it back here? Maybe they thought so, but the Allentown, the Allentown call, the morning call, put it on their whole back page. Uh, I, yes. And the Staten Island Advance also. The, uh, I just uh, um, hosted a group of uh, African exchange students at the AP, and the, uh, the, the editor, Claire Reagan, then the editor, Claire Reagan, she put it, she actually brought a copy of the Staten Island Advance showing me that it was on their back page also. I, I mean, I know from, from the movie that we were referring to that e editors everywhere were already having a problem trying to decide whether they should run this photo. I mean, there, I think there was immediate uh, recognition. Was that something that the editor at, at the AP spoke about at all? I think at that time we put at the, on the caption... Uh, there was like a lead line that said uh, graphic content or something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. on the, at the beginning of it. And it's really up to the newspaper right. or ma website or magazine, whoever wants to use the right. picture. So the AP puts it out. They don't have that same right. responsibility we, in that sense. We, yeah. it's, it's not a responsibility. It's, it's part of the we, – we don't censor our photographs. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's up to the individual paper, like the Allentown Call. Uh, they got a ton of letters uh, saying, you know, I don't want to. My family should not be seeing this, right. you know, uh, in their in their morning eating right. while they're having their cornflakes. I guess. Right. Right. Yeah, that was what what was said at the time. Mm -hmm. um, How and, long did this ban stay in effect? Because you, could, I, 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 I don't think it's a ban. I think it was a. I think it was a choice. By the newspaper, yeah, okay. by, whatever, choice, by yeah. whatever media mm -hmm. was going to use it, I think it was the choice of them. It, there was no ban. People are saying there was this picture. A, a, was heavy, a heavy and, word. The choice not to exactly. publish this. Yeah. Now I've heard it. Well, it was censored, or this. No, it wasn't censored. It was the AP still has it in the archive. It's out there. Anybody can see it on, at apimages.com. You can go look at the every photo that the AP moved on September 11th and 12th and 13th and whatever, uh, and all the stuff's there. The photograph is accessible now. Has it appeared in print since? I mean, has that stigma gone yeah, away? It, no, it, it's, I know you go on the internet. It's all over the place. It, it's appeared in print. Uh, the Los Angeles Times ran it. Uh, they ran it on their op-ed page uh, several years after September 11th. Okay. I, I've had, uh, on various anniversaries of September 11th, I've done interviews, uh, TV and radio interviews, uh, and they're uh, they want to go, they've actually taken me down to Ground Zero to talk about it, and it's not. And I've been on Fox News about it. It's like there was a. It's it's just out there, and it's a picture, and you can choose to look at it or not. But you can't negate the fact that people did fall out of the building. Were you aware though? And I I kind of want to hold on to this to the second half, but we're here now. Uh, were you aware in the immediate weeks and months and even a couple of years afterwards that this was happening, there was this kind of uh, self-censorship? Uh, were you, was that something that you were aware of or thinking about or was it just past? I mean, it was past for you. I guess I never thought about the censorship issue yeah. or however people want to say that. Right. It was, I like to say it's a, a choice right. and it's just, it's something that happened and uh, people either want to use the picture or they don't want to use the picture. Mm -hmm. It's like a picture, it's like anything, you know, illustrative story to illustrate any story. Can we talk a bit about the, um, the idea and something that you've mentioned before about, uh, the, you know, the, the continuous motor drive aspect. I don't know how else to start this, but, but the fact that, you know, you weren't aware of what, what you had taken at that there time. There was no and, decisive moment. And, it was essentially and, run and gun, essentially. And you right, were, yeah. oh, but you were aware that there was a sequence. You'd seen all the images. Um, I know there was a, uh, I, I always, I like to say that I didn't personally push the button at the time that the gentleman was in that position. Mm -hmm. That's a series of photographs, I think one of nine pictures mm -hmm. of him falling. Right. 
And the camera cycled at that moment. He could have been an inch one way or an inch right. the other way, and it wouldn't have been the exact sort of bisecting of the towers at the time. Mm -hmm. And so just by dumb luck, it happened. And it's also it's worth mentioning that the same series, in that same series, this is the only frame in which you have this serenity to it. The rest of them, there's conflict and there's chaos. This is somebody falling to their death. And then, like you said, the camera happened to catch one split moment when everything was in equanimity. It was just calm. Uh, he's never been positively identified either. Right. Mm -hmm. he's, he was originally uh, identified by the uh, reporter from the, the Toronto Internet. Globe and Mail right. who was tasked by his editor to, with this picture mm -hmm. in a large version mm -hmm. of it to walk around and look at these uh, posters that mm -hmm. were put up all over missing the city posters, yeah. with photographs of people who were missing. Mm -hmm. And so he went to Times Square and saw a picture of uh, that he thought was uh, this falling man and he wrote a story about it uh, that it was... Uh, was one of the uh, from the windows in the world, one Correct. of the workers yeah. from up there. Yeah, it, it's interesting that about six months earlier, I photographed the chef from the windows in the world. Uh, sure. We did a story about him and and, and all that, and I was so. And then six months later or so, uh, here I am photographing the fall of the building. Well, the, the movie um, does a really good job of of detailing that that search for this person and and the reporter from Toronto's attempt. And then Tom Juno's later attempt. Yeah, originally identified as a kitchen worker there. And it was allegedly his last day on the job. He had got a job at another restaurant somewhere in Midtown, oh, I think. No. It's very interesting how, how one family reacted to the possibility that this might be their relative and then also how this family reacted. And uh, To actually refuse to believe that my father, my husband, would jump. Well, because it was a sin. <sighs> yes. For him I, to, oh, I get to that. Suicide. Yeah, yes. Suicide, yes. But yeah. then and he, also they said he didn't have an orange T-shirt yes. on, which you could see uh, uh, in some of the uh, other uh, in, in some of the other images from mm -hmm. that sequence. He was wearing a like a chef's toque, which is the uh, uh, the sort of white uh, jacket. Yeah, and the jacket blew up, and the and the falling man has this orange T-shirt on. He said he didn't own an orange T-shirt. What's your relationship with the, the photo now, or do you, or even in the years since, do you? Do you look at it? I mean, you said that you went back at a certain point and, and tried to do some of your own investigation, or is it something that, you know, in the sense you want to put behind you or you want to just... Uh, it really amazes me that people still want to talk about it. Yeah. And uh, it used to be on like the fifth anniversary or the 10th anniversary or the 15th anniversary. Mm -hmm. People want to talk about these things. Actually, after the first year, first couple, three years after 9-11, I was doing a lot of interviews. And I haven't done one in a long time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, except for now. Any thoughts on, that have come to you or, or feelings with this distance that you might not have had in the first couple of years? Well, I think the photo really speaks for itself. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I can sit here and talk about it all day and what possibly happened and what did happen and whether it should be censored or wasn't censored. Uh, the picture has been used, you know, here and there uh, over time. Mm -hmm. And if it has uh, legs, then it's then the people want to see it, then they can they can find it. Yeah. It's like you say, it's it's out there on the internet. It's everywhere. Oh yeah, yeah. How do you th speaking about you know when we uh, it's also in the <coughs> September 11th museum? Yes, yes, it's in the, and they they have an alcove. Uh, in the museum that uh, it's a, with a little sign, a warning about pictures of people falling from the building. And uh, you go in there into this little, go around the little corner and they have it projected along with other people, other photos of people falling from the building. Uh, and they have it projected so you have to look up at it. So it gives you a feeling like you're looking up at the, the building. Same rather perspective. Than, yeah, yeah mm. same perspective. So you're looking up at the building and mm. in this dark, darkened little alcove to look at it. That's interesting. And one of the things I really appreciated from Tom Juno's article and, and, and the film also and him speaking was that, you know, these folks, these people, they need to be given the hallowed ground too, that, that other victims and, and, you know, heroes, what you want to call them, were were given. And, and in some, some cases, these people weren't because no one wanted to talk about it. No one wanted to look at it. No one wanted to think about the fact of how horrible their decision was. So we put it aside and he felt that it was his responsibility to kind of give these people the, the, the respect and, and the honor that they also deserve. Okay. We're going to take a short break and we come back. We're going to talk more about Falling Man with Richard Drew.
Rich, I'd like to ask you, how do you recognize a good photo in a tragic moment? Is it the same qualities for any photo? How do you, how do you hit these things? There were a lot of pictures, and I can only speak for my, my take on September 11th. There were a lot of pictures of mine that day that could have told that story without a falling man. But that photo stands out because of its symmetry, its composition. It was actually a horizontal photograph, but it's been cropped vertical because... Oh, oh yeah, it's an original horizontal image. As a matter of fact, in the September 11th Museum, they originally had it as a horizontal. And I, when I saw... I was there a couple of days before it opened and uh, with uh, then-President Obama. And I, I went into the seat in the alcove and I saw that it was a horizontal and I talked to the people and I've, they've since changed it to a vertical picture. Interesting. Vertical okay. crop, yeah. It, mm. It's definitely more powerful as, as a vertical. No two ways about that. Mm. All right. Um, yeah, but, well. but again, I guess to follow up a bit, uh, the idea that it, it the photographically it was an immediate, it spoke to you immediately. I mean, because you were looking at the sequences. So, so here, what about that and this image? I mean, uh, it's called the editing process. Yeah. You know, you can go through a whole take of your vacation pictures and mm -hmm. then there will be that sunset or that wave crashing over your son or daughter and they're <laughs> freaking out, whatever it happens to be, and you'll see, oh, that's the picture. And that's what I have to do every day. I can be, like I said, on the floor of the stock exchange and it depends on whether some man's hand is up or down or their facial expression. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the body position of, of the falling man in, in this frame is what distinguishes it from everything else. I mean, it, there's just something that... Well, that's also, that's just part of it though, because yeah. it's also the background, because if there was a chaotic background there, mm -hmm. it would just be, I think, another falling person photograph. Mm -hmm. But those those vertical lines, mm -hmm. they change the context of everything. One other picture that's very large in, in the museum, in the 9-11 Museum, is another picture I shot during the, originally the collapse of the first building. Uh, it shows a lot of the debris coming down, and uh, a couple weeks later, uh, uh, someone from the Time Life Photo Lab called over to the Associated Press and said, wanted to speak to me, and I said, well, well what's going on? He says, oh, do you know there's a person holding on to a hunk of debris in one of those pictures? And I said, what? He said, yeah, take a look at this frame number, so-and-so, and, -so. and it's, the picture's hanging in the museum. I don't know whether they know it or not, but if you turn your head like this to the side, lean over to the right, you can see a person wearing a white shirt holding onto a piece of debris as it's coming down, as he's, and so it's inside that hole coming down. So we spoke about this a bit earlier, but in, in the... The days after, were you aware of the the outcry and or is the backlash you would call it? Uh, yeah, about, at what about point this did you start getting? Did you start hearing kickback about this? You know, pushback? I don't remember if there was really at that time. You know, this big outcry. I didn't. I didn't get that. I, I don't remember any of that. You know, that I was going to be. You know, it's going to be this. People were saying, "Oh gosh, look at this picture," and all. A lot of papers used it, including the New York Times. A lot of people didn't use it because again, of content. Did you take offense of that? Did you did that outrage you in any way or did you, did you kind of get it? I guess it's up to community standard. You know, it's up to whether the, the newspaper thought it was something that their readers wanted to see at the time. Yeah, but for yourself though, I mean, I mean, as a photographer or as, a, as, a, as an individual, your just picture can't, your personal but take But your picture it? can't be everywhere all the time. Oh, you know? no, your of course not. Your pictures can't be, but that picture was of a certain type. You know, we didn't see other, there was a lot of, there were no other pictures like that. We saw people, uh, we saw pictures of the building coming down. We saw pictures of the explosions. We saw people Yeah, well, the first grieving. six pages of the Times here yeah. is, is everything from that day. Reactions and all, yeah, exactly. We saw a lot of that, but we didn't see that. You know, we didn't see people dying. There were no pictures of people laying on the ground who had fallen from the building. No. No. Nothing that I'd ever seen. No. In reading, editors from around the world were saying, why are these images not being seen? Uh, suggesting that they were being suppressed. But I think the fact is that these photos just could not exist because their people were not close enough. And then the buildings collapsed. And frankly, victims were disintegrated. I mean, there there's, wasn't a there's lot a, of, There's actually yeah. video. There's a... Uh, a, a Reuters photographer who has since retired. He, I've seen his video of people coming to falling from the building, mm -hmm. you know, coming down from the building. Oh, so yeah. Yeah, there's, there, there's a lot of that. Yeah. But it's amazing how fast they fall. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever yeah. seen Ten it in real time. Yeah. But uh, And there was 
phrases that have been used a lot about this this image and, and the stillness and the grace and even freedom is words that are that are brought up in terms of this last minute decision. Um, you'd seen the sequence. You you knew that this was kind of an anomaly compared to the rest of them. Was that a, were those phrases that that rung true to you, or were you, did you have kind of issue to say, well, wait a second, this is just one f- frame, almost you know per, by chance caught this way. So when when you saw those phrases and and those words being described, or the image being described that way, did you? How did you, you think? You know, it's up to interpretation. Yeah. You know, individual interpretation. Whether you think it's a, uh, just a a nice, it's a beautiful picture for its symmetry mm-hmm. and all. But then you have to look at it and think, wow, this is a tragedy. This was one part of a tragedy, mm-hmm. and this is probably one of the only human elements besides the picture of Father Judge being carried out. Right. Oh yeah. That, yeah. that really that really shows the human element of this tragedy. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of people reacting, looking up. We see people, you know, uh, firefighters and responders, all that. And uh, it just happens that this picture caught the human element Mm -hmm. of that day. And kind of piggybacking on Alan's question, as a journalist, how did did you feel that this is the type of thing that needs to be seen? Uh, so when you heard that, or maybe you didn't hear, but when you found out that people were retracting the image or, or not continuing to, d- to publish it, did it bother you at all as a journalist? As a, as a journalist, I think that it has to be seen. It, it's part of history. Uh, you can't hide history. Look at a book, and it's still gonna, the history is still going to be there. Uh, my picture is in books, too. Uh, it's been recently in a book by Time magazine, the 100 Most Influential Photographs. And I'm I'm very humbled by that. In in later years, as we went into several wars, and and imaging um, became an issue. I mean, there was strict kind of D- Department of Defense uh, protocols as to what could be seen, and 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 you mentioned earlier, you know, comparing it to the Vietnam era when, you know, caskets coming home were not to be displayed. Uh, but dead now, soldiers were not to be but displayed. But we are seeing pictures of caskets coming back. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, again, I think everything, and, and we're seeing your image, it doesn't, all you need to do is click on, on the website. So, I mean, and this is kind of pre-explosion of, of media and, and, and imagery on the internet. But do you think about that in terms of a, kind of a, a larger censorship or self-censorship that's going on now uh, in terms of images I don't, that people know, want to see? Right now, I don't think there is any censorship anymore. You can see pictures of anything online there's everything is fair game mm-hmm. and certainly now you say uh, online though but what about in print like say the new york times how would the new york times how do you think the times or any of the major news outlets would handle your photograph today because we're in a different mindset right now so many more things are acceptable do you think that that picture would a be as controversial and b be as hushed down after so soon. I, I think it would still be controversial. I don't think it would be hushed down. I think it would get people talking. It would be more of a more of a talking point than it would be a censorship point. I, I would agree with by, you. That. I mean censorship by whatever media would happen. Yeah. Have it in print. Yeah. I think it would become more of a topic for discussion. And more it, be, it would get wider use now because everyone can pick up their phone. I mean, I, I, I walk down the street and I tell people, look up. I yell at them. I'm a crotchety old man. I said, look you up. You too? <laughs> Just on my way over here today, I yelled at somebody on 34th Street. There was a, a quote that I read about the image and, and maybe in one way to look at why people retreated from the image uh, like they, because it feels like you're looking at a private moment. You, you know, there, there's this sense that... That they, I've invaded they, someone's space. Well, yeah. Or we as the viewer are, are invading someone's space, someone's you know, private, ultimate decision. Um, I think there's some legitimacy to that. But uh, we, but we don't know that, do no, we? No, we don't. No, no. I mean, we, I we think, don't know what, if it was his decision, or it was. Yeah, I mean, know, look. The truth of the matter is, what's the difference between photographing falling men and photographing a homeless person sitting on the street? You know, it's interesting. We don't use many pictures of homeless people because you can't identify them as homeless. We don't know that. Do you know he's homeless? Because he's sitting on the street. Did you know that falling man jumped? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. That's right. But he's falling. He's falling. And the other person is living on the street, at least at the moment. Well. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. This is a big open discussion here. Okay, Mm -hmm. yes. Well, I think that many people have talked, uh, and certainly Junod in his article, is that 
leaving the 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 person unknown is is more important than than finding out who the person I, is. I I agree hundred yeah. percent. I really do. And then it's become the symbol for everybody that's been lost. It and, becomes and, a shared uh, experience because yeah, we all own it to a certain extent. There. You know, people those people who were falling from the building, I couldn't see them when they hit the ground. They no. were falling out of my view. Right. Out of my view, I I was standing where the uh, where the Goldman Sachs building is now at mm -hmm. West and Vesey Street, and there was. You know obstructions and all, but I could hear them. You could hear them. Yeah, that, I could that's, hear them. You'd said that uh, regarding the the photo of Bobby Kennedy and and others that that people were not asked to look away in earlier eras of photography, um, and and now or at least post nine eleven and and the era that we're in now, uh, we're, we're doing that or we're being asked or told to look away. Is that something that that you would? Uh, I mean, I to confront the, the reality of the situation. Uh, and maybe there's there's something that's going on here that's bigger than just this image. We're, 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 we're being asked to ignore the realities of what we're involved with as a nation and as a people. Uh, do you find that to be the case at all? I don't think we're ignoring any of the hardship that's going on now in Houston. We see people being carried out, people being helped out. I was watching, uh, when I was in New Orleans just this last weekend, I was watching on CNN, uh, a live TV of people being rescued from homes, you know, as this like 80 year old man being pulled into this boat, you know, and, and this is all harsh reality. This is happening. We don't want to, would you turn away from that? No. Do you think there's a certain curiosity that people have that they just sort of, you know, you can't take your eyes off of something? It's, it's, it's really, it, we're in a different era now. We're in a different, we're in a 24 seven news cycle. There is no, Afternoon and morning newspaper were like where I used to work. You know, you only saw your news twice a day and the, and at the 6 o'clock news or maybe even that later at the 11 o'clock news at that time. How about all the people with their um, mobile phones and they're photographing uh, people getting shot in the back as they're running away by the police at, at some incident I can remember or someone uh, – how about – we see these uh, – the police cams, the police cameras. There's so much immediacy right now. Everything is immediate, immediate, immediate. And there's – like you said before, there's censorship but there's really not. It's, it's more and more things are acceptable. I don't think it would be – I don't – I think more people would have used the falling man picture today than they would be – than did in uh, – 2001. That's again. That's my hunch also. And by having these images, that's what lets us know what's right or wrong, and helps a lot of people make some moral decisions when you see certain things that may not be pleasant. This is you mentioned with Houston right now, and, and people being rescued, and and the idea that this gets me back to the thought that many of the images we saw after 9/11 were either what I would describe as spectacle, the explosions and and the tumbling of the buildings or the heroes. I mean, that, that kind of became uh, the, the set of images that we are most familiar with now, you know, firefighters or the raising of the flag, which is, you know, kind yeah. of repeating images, repeating ideas that Americans anyway are very familiar with. You know, we, and, and obviously I think that's, that's how we deal with things. You know, that's how you, you make good out of bad, good out of horrible. But is it, is it fair to say that that also kind of keeps us from looking at the reality of, of, of the, these choices that people had to make and, and the horrors and do we, do we really want to see those? I mean, I, I, I would, I guess my, my point is that your image, uh, being pushed to the side in those weeks after indicated that we didn't want to talk about this stuff. Well, it wasn't pushed to the side of the weeks after it was really sort of pushed aside the day after, mm. uh, you know, people move on and that, that picture appeared to, on September 11th, and it was in print September 12th, and and it's been used in a couple other pla papers. I know I got a pa copy of paper from Japan mm -hmm. that's the size of the New York Times. They used it as the whole back page of the newspaper. Right. It wasn't like they were gonna, you know, not going to use it. But it's not a picture that you need to. That's unless we're going to talk about falling man, that needs to be in print all the time or be out there. You can go seek it out, but there unless there's some uh, relevance in whatever topic they're going to write about. Uh, I don't see a reason why Falling Man is being suppressed in any way. It just isn't topical. Mm. When we're, like you said at the beginning, we're up to year 16 now. Yeah. Yeah. You could say, I guess, about any photograph that will appear in any newspaper today. I mean, some of them might make frequent guest appearances and some of them may not ever be seen again because there was no reason to bring them back. Uh, going back to Staten Island about the uh, African-American man who was... Uh, uh, 
who died after being put in a chokehold. Yeah. And that keeps popping up every once in a while in the in the newspaper. That was actually still framed from a, a citizen journalist video. Right. Yeah. Because that's still part of the of the public conversation. Absolutely. Right now. It's part of the dialogue that's yes. going on. That mm-hmm. the issue has not gone over. We're not cleaning up and putting up a new building in its place. Yeah, it's still an issue. You had said at one point that and this is going back, that in, in 10 years we'll be able to look at this photo as part of the whole of that day as what really happened. So as as you said, we're 16 years out and you feel that we're, we're at that stage, right? The photo is, is part the, of the story. It, it is part of the story yeah. because, as I said before, it's part of the human element of that story. We don't see many human elements it's like you said, heroes. For a year afterwards, uh, the AP rented an apartment where we could look into – uh, ground Zero and the cleanup, and I had to man that during some of my eight-hour shifts for over during that year's time. Really, and I sit in there, and and every once in a while there'd be a a, a group of firefighters would come out uh, with a flag-draped uh, stretcher, mm-hmm. and you know that was a mem- one member of the service, either a police or a fireman that they found in in the rubble, mm-hmm. and we had the, when we used those pictures too. So well, how was, long, I'm sorry, how long after? For how long were you covering this event, uh, 9-11 and the, and the cleanup and the follow-up? Was this something that was a, a year of coverage or well, it, almost? It, even after that, yeah. sure, of course. And even the uh, the anniversary the every year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it doesn't – it's something you've – I was thinking about this morning before I came here because the September 11th is coming up real right. soon about what kind of ceremony they're going to have this year. It keeps getting less and less. They read mm. the names. They ring the bell when the two buildings fell and when the planes hit and when the buildings fell. But um, I, I don't know what – I was just thinking in my mind today what's going to happen on September 11th again. Mm. Actually, I was thinking this may be the first year I go down. I, I've never gone to those ceremonies and I think – I'm going to tell you a yeah. secret. I haven't – I have never been to one of those ceremonies uh, my editor, who was working for a competitive news service at the time, uh, uh, he always had me uh, uh, sitting on the uh, sitting on the desk uh, editing the pool photos. And in terms of daily day to day coverage, how long did it extend? Do you recall after? Mm, no, I don't remember. I know it was a long time, long time though. though. Yeah, at, for at least that first year, yeah. because we were had to cover things on the ground as well as, uh, like I said, from this apartment where we could look into the thing, and we manned it uh, twenty four hours a day. You know, just related, we're talking about invasion of privacy and, you know, how, how this information is shared. And we're talking about a photograph that a lot of people took very personally and, and internalized. One of the things that I, I rediscovered when looking for this 9-11 newspaper, which I knew I had somewhere in the house. And I have one somewhere nights. too, but I don't know where it is either. <laughs> I had a... I, I saved several newspapers over the course of that year that struck me as interesting. And going back, the following Sunday in the New York Times Week in Review, there was an article about last conversations on phones. And they were quoting between people in the planes that went down. And uh, some people were able to get cell service from the planes when they knew it was happening. And definitely from the towers, both towers, people who were trapped and making last calls to loved ones and things like that and reaching out. And they were quoting from many people, giving names and really giving real personal – this is as personal as it gets. May 26, the same year, a cover story in the New York Times, again going back to last words – giving names, giving words, giving dialogue that was private conversations between husbands and wives, parents and children, loved ones. That were okay on. But a lot of people had the same had, – for the same reasons that we want to hear what people are saying, we can't look at this picture because we're, quote, unquote, invading a private space. I was – on that point, I was able to help someone get closure for their fiancé uh, who died at – during uh, the September 11th attacks at the World Trade Center. Um, I don't remember what the time frame was, how many years later. It had to be, I don't know, five or six years, maybe more. Uh, someone called me and said, a gentleman from New Jersey, he said, you know, I, I think you might have photographed my fiance uh, falling from the World Trade Center. I said, well, if you'd like to come over here and I, I'll – I'll let you look through the take, well, you know, the, the photographs and we can sit together. And we actually did a story about this too, about the, the AP did a story about this uh, gentleman coming to see. And, and we went through the pictures of the people falling from the World Trade Center. And he said, oh, yeah, here she is because he remembered she had on her tan pants that day and whatever color. I forget the color of the, of the blouse she was wearing. 
or the shirt. And uh, he said, yes, that's, that's her. So he was able to get closure on this person. So I was, I, I think I was able to help him, uh, uh, even though I might have invaded his privacy by having a picture of this woman falling, her privacy, but I was able to help him uh, get closure on this too. So there was a good and a bad part of this if you want to look both sides of that. Well, I think one takeaway and, and is that people who are really involved, I think they want to know. They may not want to see graphic, horrible images, but they need to know as much as they can in order to find some peace. Uh, I, people say, how can you see this and not be affected by it? They ask me these questions every once in a while, but especially about September 11th. And uh, I'm a father of four, uh, and uh, I was... Uh, in the Dominican Republic covering an assignment, uh, a baseball, the world base, uh, I'm sorry, the Caribbean baseball series. And I got a call at like two in the morning from one of our editors in New York saying that a airplane uh, full of German tourists had crashed in the, in the Caribbean on, in, uh, on the other side of the island. So myself and a reporter hired a, a driver and we drove to the other side of the island and I was standing on the dock where they were bringing the bodies back and like in, this is not the Coast Guard, but in private boats and they were laid out, the bodies were laid out on the decks of these boats and I had to take a break from that. I just went around behind this little truck and I sort of stood there a minute and composed myself and went back. My wife said that the camera's a filter for me, you know, a filter for what I see. I think it has to be. Yeah. Well, camera is a filter. I mean, just a lot more trivial. We, we recently had an eclipse and, and some of the biggest experts out there said, don't look through a picture, experience it. Don't look through your camera. Be there. And that's part of the same thing. So yeah, a camera is a filter. No two ways about it. Uh, in, on that point, uh, on September 11th, uh, one of our uh, senior photographers at the time, he didn't go downtown. He made the famous picture that he went to the top of Rockefeller Center and he to the top of the rock and he photographed the Empire State Building in the in foreground. The foreground and yes. And this, he also went over in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral and made another telling picture of this Asian woman reacting, uh, watching, and she could see it from Fifth, from Fifth Avenue, what was going on. And he was from New Jersey and he couldn't get home on that night. So he came to stay at our apartment. I live on the Upper West Side. And uh, my wife had made us dinner and, and we were sitting there. And she, she says that we talked about everything except what we did that day. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, the reaction shots are some of the ones that always get me the, the most emotional when I see the, the faces of the people who are reacting to what they're seeing, uh, certainly in video, you know, yeah, but yeah. still images as well. There, there's some of the, well, I'm not sure why that, you know, you're, you're kind of mirroring their reactions and feeling it a lot deeper than, for example, seeing a, an exploding building or whatnot. Um, Maybe as a, at least my last question, Alan, I don't know if you have any, it's something I want to get back to. You You had spoken about the fact or, or the idea that um, it's very difficult, this photo became difficult for people because they, they, they identified with this person. Yes. Um, what, uh, is there anything else that you, you can maybe expand on this idea why this photo might, may have been so hard for people? I mean, I, I, I agree with that and, and I think it, we, we just go down that line and we ask ourselves the same questions that this person might have been asking themselves. And, or what they were experiencing and, and, and the choices that they had to make. And, and I think that that speaks to it, you know, this identification problem. I think you've just hit the nail on the head. Mm. I, I can't think of any other reason why people would shun away from, shy away from this photograph except that it's, it's very personal for them or maybe they have feelings for that person who was in that photograph, that they were thinking, you know, wow, look at this, this what happened to this person and I'm home safe. I know one of my own personal experience, uh, I was working on West 21st Street at the time, and when we heard that something had happened, we, we took turns walking to the corner and looking down 6th Avenue, and it kept striking me that people were just milling around, watching, and just over a mile away, clear shot, is hell. You see two buildings in flames, and you see smoke pouring into the heavens, yet where we were... It was quiet, blue skies, and, you know, just there was an awareness that was going on, increasing awareness that was going on, more and more people showing the streets. But I was surprised because I, I was walking back. Uh, there's the only way to get, oh, they had shut down subways and buses and everything. Yeah. And I was walking back uh, up, I walked over by um, then St. Vincent Hospital, 
and they had all the doctors and nurses waiting outside for victims to show up, and there were no victims. No one showed up. And so I made my way over, and I tried to make a phone call to uh, my office, and I was able to call them. I found a, a messenger service that still had phone service, I had, a, had a landline. And I called him. I said, "I'm okay. I'm gonna. I'm on my way back." And I had to walk up, uh, back up Sixth Avenue, the office. And uh, I was wearing all black at the time. And of course, I was covered with this dust. And somebody turned to me on uh, on the street, and said, uh, uh, "Wow, where, where, where have you been?" You know, they. And, but people wow. were listening. People were gathered around cars that were parked on. They listened to the car radios about what was going on. And uh, so it was really sort of that. There's another dichotomy. People were going, "Oh, like where have you been?" That I would be all covered in this dust. Yeah, it was really, uh, it's really sad. Richard, this has been a really, really wonderful uh, 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 podcast episode. Thank and you. Uh, any parting thoughts about uh, photography, journalism that you'd like to share? Uh, one of my editors many years ago said, the best thing you can do in this job is your homework. And uh, if I go on a job, if I get assigned to go photograph some politician or whatever it happens to be, I have to know who this guy is, whether it may be some celebrity, if it's not in my, in my purview. So I, uh, I read the New York Times first thing in the morning at 5.30 when I get up. On my way to work, I buy the New York Daily News from the, cigarette, from the cigar store around the corner. And I'm, that's my morning read while I'm on the train, either I'm going to the stock exchange or not. And on the way home, I'll buy the New York Post because I like to read the gossips and all that. And, <laughs> and so I can keep up with that part of it. So I have to know my job. I'm doing my homework. Thank you. Another fine show here done. Um, little plug, selfish plug for ourselves here. Uh, if you are not already a subscriber to our show, go to iTunes, the b &H Photography Podcast. It's free. We have, what, going on 90 episodes uh, posted free. You could download them anytime. Tons of wonderful information. Uh, I go back to a lot of the shows and I'm often amazed. I, I don't remember talking about half the things we even discussed in some of the shows, so I'm always relearning things. In addition to the conversation on Falling Man, we actually spoke about a lot of other aspects of Richard's career. Uh, he was at the assassination of Robert Kennedy as a young photographer. He was 21, uh, and he has a Pulitzer Prize to his name. And we spent a lot of time discussing those aspects of his life. The show went a little bit too long to include it here, but we decided it's also too good to let go. So as a little treat, next week we're going to be having a short bonus session with Richard Drew talking about hit the earlier parts of his career. And again, we're going to be releasing this mini episode sometime next week on behalf of John and Jason and myself and our guest today, uh, Richard Drew. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>